call this meeting to order. This is June 22nd meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. Uh, first thing we can do is approve the agenda. Everyone received a copy electronically. Will you take a look? We have a motion to approve. I move to approve. I'll second. <laughs> okay, motion by Ariane and uh, second by Barb. All in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye, okay. sorry, I was muted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as long as we have four votes to prove the agenda. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. All righty. Uh, moving on. Comments from the chair. I mean, I, I, I've got... Uh, I've got no comments, um, although, you know, later on we're going to be talking about, it looks like Mike has an update for the hearing for July 13th. That's going to be the big thing coming up. Um, we're going to be covering a lot of ground. Um, I'm not sure actually what Mike has to say for that, so uh, we'll find out. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is general business. Uh, looks like we don't have anyone besides uh, staff and commission members and ORCA. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Oh, and Aaron's there. Okay, good. He was off the screen for a second. Okay. Uh, okay, so with that, we've got no general business, so we can consider the minutes from June 8th. Can everyone take a look? Uh, the minutes were just sent around like your email. Um, I wasn't here for that meeting, but I guess I can vote yes or approve them if you need me to. <laughs> yeah, technically you're allowed to. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think the final clarification on the motion, I think that's correct. Basically said that Aaron went back to his original wording, which we thought was to extend the Eastern Gateway to Pioneer Street. Is that correct? I don't remember, but it sounds good to me. Aaron, are you on? I, I am. I don't, I don't have a camera. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's my recollection. Okay. Yeah, I think that's correct as well. Motion to approve. Okay. Motion by Barb. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Stephanie. All in favor of approving the minutes? Say aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Okay, minutes approved. That brings us to Mike. Do uh, you have an update for the, on the hearing for us? Uh, I just wanted to give you guys the, I emailed the, the, the draft map, which just highlighted the two parcels that are being shifted. Um, the hearing is in the process of being warned. So it is all set to go for the 13th. And that was really all I was going to say on that. There wasn't any, wasn't too much. Um, other than I'm going through the motions of getting it all approved, uh, getting, not getting it all worn, which is um, always a, a large bureaucratic process, so. But we're doing more than just that uh, zoning district change uh, at the July meeting, correct? Correct, it's both the design review that we've already looked at and this new addition. And we won't be, I guess the other big important piece is we won't be looking at the um, on the record review. Uh, I think that's just gonna have to be tabled until we can get um, some time and get some staff back. Um, and when we do, we can go through and have a legal review and work with 
the DRB and DRC to kind of take a look at things and then we'll revisit it. We've got we've got that mapped out. We just have to go and put it together now. So this will just look at the design review rules that we'd already looked at and the uh, and the change in the zoning district. Mike, you said you emailed that out. That draft I map. I think I emailed the map out today. Today, okay. Um, I haven't pulled the map up yet, but just just to make sure I understand, Mike, the map just reflects what the zoning would look like if we extended Eastern Gateway to Pioneer Street. It just uh, puts a crosshatch over the areas that are going to be shifted to Eastern Gateway. So you can look through the crosshatch and see what exists today. And the crosshatch identifies the area to be rezoned. OK. Mike, just a question. Um, that whole prop, that's the whole property, right? That's just that, that parcel and then the car wash on the end? Yes. But then there, what's the orange just above that? Is there another parcel there? That's the river. Or that's that's then, just the river. Okay, so yeah, that would end up being, that's not like a weird corner. It's just the river. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I can go through and have them remap. So the other piece, I think, is the Country Club Road. So there's a little bit of the river, a little bit of Country Club Road. And technically, I guess these guys own a really tiny sliver of land on the other side of the river. And we can go through and have them amend the map to 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 show all of that being rezoned. Um, this right, is what they gave me. Looking at it like this, it just it looks like, yeah, I recognize that it's the river, but right now it looks like there's a piece that's going to stay riverfront right in the middle, which is confusing. Yeah, so I can I can ask them to adjust that um, on the map because it hasn't been warned yet. So, all right. So it's warned. not just the parcel; it's just the line goes all the way to Pioneer Street. Yeah. There's, so there's I can go and I could edge. have them put the river put the river and put the road in as well. Yeah, that would and help a lot. There, all right. Is there another like sliver of parcel on the other side of the river, um, between the river and Old Country Club Road, that's still riverfront? Um, that would end up being just a weird line. It should stay. It should I be staying as river front. On the other it's side of the really, river? It's a really narrow strip. But I can't, I'm not sure if that's actually. Like, it's just yeah, on the side of the road. It's tough to tell whether that's the road right of way or whether that's a separate but I can have them adjust all of that on that side. So, Mike, is there some kind of an easement that runs through their property? That's Maybe. the railroad. There's the railroad that goes through. You kind of have these three long, these two two long lines. One is the railroad, and one is the river. Well, the crosshatch is their property, right? The crosshatch is their property, and in through through their property is the railroad bed. Uh, okay. Oh, right. But we also have railroad on the other side of the river. But that's that's colored green. Okay. And between the railroad colored green and the river is Old Country Club Road. And so if this change happened, it would then mean that we would end up with the purple color extending further. Uh, it, the purple is presently the um, Eastern Gateway? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. Right, so this yeah. makes it look like we're just adding the parcel, but I think based on our motion, we're extending it all the way to Pioneer Street, which would cover all of the part that's making it confusing for me, which is the river and that little strip of land that I don't imagine is very much. On yeah, the other which side. is actually Country yeah. Club Road. So it's it's it would be clearer if those other if the Country Club Road and the river were also looped into that. Unfortunately, I've been putting up hay and dealing with stuff on the side, and this is what they sent me. And so I figured, well, I'll get this out. So this is this is what we have. I didn't have time to get another revision through. But. Yeah, I guess I my understanding of our change was just to the river. 
um, and Pioneer Street, not on the other side of the river. Because on that side, it's not appropriate as Eastern Gateway. Right, which is why I was wondering, Barb, how much of what that actually is, because if we make everything across the river is all Eastern Gateway, then it's just this little strip. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate to be across the river because that's really completely different in characteristic. After walking down there it's, and seeing it from the riverside. Uh, I, see what, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's probably the more appropriate zoning designation on the other side would be rural. Um, because Old Country Club Road doesn't have sewer and water, and that's why those other areas are green, is because they're zoned rural. So oh. what should probably be, the question is, what color do we make the river itself? Um, it looks like farther up, it's going down the middle of the river. So if you see how it kind of jogs in, um, as you're going upstream, oh. you see how it kind of steps in? That's, it looks like they were going down the middle of the river in other areas. So maybe what we'll end up with is continue down the middle of the river. Above that would all be green, north of that. And the south of that to the riverbank, basically the, the middle of the river to the riverbank would be purple, Eastern Gateway. Well, it'd be cross hatched for the proposal. That makes sense. And then yeah. that little sliver of property that they have that's across the river is just in the rural. That would be in the rural, correct. Which that I would think make we sense tried to, to avoid parcel, like we tried to avoid cutting up parcels, but that's such a weird piece anyway that I don't think that should make yeah. a difference. I don't even think they probably know they have it. And I don't even know if technically they know they have it. It's just how it shows up on the on the grand list. So I'll have that, that cross hatch, one set of crosshatch to identify river north to rural and uh, then continue this, the other crosshatch to the center line. Do we need to make a new motion for that? Probably. You can probably make it simple as proposed by Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what Mike just said, <laughs> or, or maybe just that Mike will cha have the um, the um, proposed map modified to reflect our discussion, which would put the the border boundary in the middle of the river. Is that right, Mike? Yes, it would okay. move the eastern gateway boundary to the middle of the river and make the northern portion to be proposed to be changed to rural. Okay. So there'll, there'll be a vote at the hearing, right? I mean, that'll be when we can make the appropriate motion. Yes. Yeah. And that one can be easy because then it's just a <laughs> map as presented. Okay, so we don't need to make a motion right now? No, I think I'll okay, be good. We're good. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. I will, I'll get that to Pam and we'll get that adjusted. Okay. So friendly reminder, though, that, uh, you know, we still have the discussion ahead of us on uh, the wisdom of making any changes there. So that, that foreshadows how my views are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, taking another look at it, Kirby, yeah, I can see that this, at the property, I can see that that will be an interesting discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think there needs to be a buffer between between the Eastern Gateway and, and that far into town. But, um, we can talk about it next time. Uh, so, okay, so that Mike, that, was that your, that was your um, update for us, right? So yeah. then all we've got left to do today is to talk about the economic development implementation strategy for the city plan. So, does everyone have that document? I, I think we can go through with Mike. So this one, um, we had gone through a version that I had put together with the 
previous MDC director before she left. And afterwards, you know, we had had a lot of discussion about various pieces of it. So I, I just wanted to jump back in and take another stab at it. So I went through and grabbed um, the city council had been doing a lot of work on their strategic plan. So I wanted to take a bunch of their elements. And when I looked at their strategic goals as it applied to economic development, a lot of the pieces didn't appear in, in our document. So I wanted to go through like things like um, this, the city council really values um, jobs that pay a livable wage. And when I looked at the one I had given to you guys, there was really no discussion of living wages or other other things like that. So I tried to go back through and, you know, I kind of reconfigured how things were laid out to try to better match what were the city council strategic goals and get a little bit away from how the MDC had formulated the economic development strategy. So that's but a lot of the strategies in there haven't changed. They may have moved places and moved around, but the strategies themselves seem to be there. I thought this one was laid out a little bit better than the previous one, but I guess that's where I would just kick this conversation off by saying this is why I made the changes. And and to try to capture some of these other ideas that had been out there. Mike, when were those ideas under discussion by the city council? They've been going for the past year or two. A lot of what was in the previous EDSP and other economic development planning we're all under the previous city council. And by previous, I really mean, you know, the global previous under the former mayor. Um, there was a big watershed change in what, 2018 maybe? And the council really turned over a number of seats and uh, they, they took a, a different course um, as it applied to economic development. And so I think the previous version kind of matched the previous, um, maybe the previous administration more. And this one I tried to adjust to, to, to the newer, the newer one. Well, well, I'll jump in here. Um, um, the whole re way that this reads is as if we are going back to business as usual. And I'm just not getting that. Um, I don't think it addresses COVID and the cha economic development changes that will have to happen as a result of that. Um, and the changes that have already happened in terms of, of grant funding and things uh, like that. So I'm just really concerned that um, if, if this were to go forward to the public, they would be saying, you know, do we have our head in the sand? Um, how does this address COVID? Okay, this really wasn't wasn't drafted with that specific case in mind. It was mostly written, as I say, April seventh is the date on the top. Um, even though I've made a few tweaks uh, afterwards, but yes, it it hasn't gone in to specifically address that situation. What would you be thinking of? Um, I hate to say it. I mean, I know that you've spent time on this and. Um, a lot of time on this, but it sort of seems like the ground has shifted and um, that what we need to be looking at is is maybe a different kind of economic development plan. And I'm not clear if the city council is addressing that. Um, I'm assuming that they are. Um, there are, are, you know, there's grant funding that is addressing some of the economic um, recovery issues that are coming up for businesses. Um, but I really think we have to, we have to address that um, in some way, because I just don't see that we will be returning to business as usual. 
sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're welcome to, to adjust this as we see fit. You know, I, I've explained how I adjusted it and why I adjusted it. Um, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I think. And, and you did do it, you know, in accordance with everything up through that, you know, uh, beginning of April, perhaps, because we didn't know what was going to be happening through April and May. Um, and now it's June. So I think that, um, and do we have a head of the um, uh, development corporation? We don't right now, right? No. No, no. okay. So that kind of leaves you without anybody to work with on this. No, and we still have still have Dan from Montpelier Live. Right, and right. Wasn't but there a, sorry, wasn't there someone hired to help with COVID recovery? Does that person have any economic expertise or is, does their role extend to economic recovery? I think that's what, I think economic recovery was specifically their role. But yeah, she was, she's a recovery officer or something like that. So she might be a good person to loop in. Right, yeah, to, to really see what she thinks about this. I think that's a, a good idea, Stephanie. I mean, I think one of the questions is we're looking at an eight-year plan. Um, you know, COVID, for all the issues that it is going to present over the next uh, year, perhaps two, um, it's the, the question is, how is this going to change fundamentally? You know, as we said, we're, we're laying this out as, you know, um, basing our economy on, you know, sense of place, high quality downtown, being an affordable place to live. Um, you know, um, supporting quality private developments and ensuring projects will have access to ample infrastructure. You know, that's how we make these uh, projects happen. How do we make savings happen? How do we make the Grossman's lot redevelopment happen? These are all things, that's how we help those projects happen. Um, right, I, but I think the changes are gonna extend for the eight years, at least, if not more. And so maybe the way we approach development may actually change. It's, it's true that some of those goals are going to be remain the same. We certainly want to increase housing. Um, we want to increase the vibrancy of, of the downtown. Um, and, but I think that it may take a different approach. Um, and something that we haven't considered yet. So I guess I would be reluctant to go forward with this uh, assuming business as usual without uh, looking at it more with people who are maybe on the ground right now, like the, the recovery officer, Dan Groberg, any other people uh, who um, might be able to weigh in on this. Can you give us some specific examples, Barb, of the, the sort of thing that you think is going to need to change? Um, well, for example, um, certainly the MDC receiving a hundred uh, hundred thousand dollars a year in funding from the city that could substantially change um and so if we're depending on that that's the issue that could really come back to us is, that, I, because you, is that because you expect that there's going to be like less funding to go around like things oh, yeah. are you're hurting okay yes yeah, okay. yeah. Let's, way let's... less funding and um also that in addition to that that you know, the strategies for the tax, I mean, a tax stabilization program is great, our tax TIF program is great, but I think that we need to be looking at um, something a little bit more active under aspiration B um, about Montpelier will maintain a robust local economy. Um, and it, by supporting quality private developments, I think that, you know, that, that whole issue needs a new look. And, um, you know, I'm not a development specialist, but I think that at least, you know, to, uh, to perhaps uh, sit um, Kevin down with, so Kevin's involved, was involved with this as well, right, Mike? Yes. Yes, okay, so sitting Kevin down with the recovery officer, uh, assuming that she's still under contract, and, um, and Dan Groberg and, and maybe even, you know, a round table of, of other people in, in the uh, community 
in order to make this a more viable document now that the ground has really changed under our feet. So this is all good work based on with the way the world was before. Um, I just don't see the world being the same place that it was then. So I guess my confusion is whether the, the issue is with we're, we're moving towards a different vision or we've got the same vision and we need to adjust the strategies we're using to get there. We may have a different vision, but I don't know that there has been an in-depth discussion about it even. And I don't know where the city council's discussion has been in terms of economic development either. Um, it seems like, you know, this is sort of is one of the most critical pieces of the city plan. And I think it's going to take a new look from all of the parties that are involved in order to know, is this the appropriate way for us to be moving forward? And maybe it is just strategies in terms of, of achieving the same goals um, and, and the same aspirations. Um, but that, that would be nice because that limits it more. Um, I'm just not certain yet that that's all it would be. I think it's also, it's highlighting for us what, how, how hard it is to be a local business in a small town. It was already hard, and now it's highlighting things like this, the significant need for a really strong online presence and an ability to be adaptive. And so I think that the way that we support our businesses is changing. And I think making sure that they're able to survive through things like this, I think there's, there's different, potentially different support needs there. For the sustainability yeah, I, of the business. I would agree with that, yeah. And we also don't really know how we haven't really seen the full impact in terms of what businesses we might lose from downtown. That's, That's true. So yeah, Barbara, I'm broadly, broadly, I agree with you. I think generally the aspirations are probably still the same, um, but some of the approach or some of the focus might need to shift slightly. Or just at least, uh, would benefit from considering this as a significant component. Yeah, I mean, so so Barb, you mentioned reaching out to others to look at it. I mean, is it worthwhile for us to discuss this, discuss things as well? Like, uh, I really like the idea that just developed between the two of you about having some aspirations or something in there that addresses the city helping fill in vacant, um, you know, vacant storefronts. Is that something that we need to include that we maybe wouldn't have before? Um, well, that is certainly a piece of it, but I think if I'm understanding what Stephanie said, it's more broad in terms of supporting businesses in a in an ever shifting climate and not operating under the assumption that the climate will go back to where it was before and before it was a struggle for our businesses. And you know, and she's right that we don't know at this point, who's who's going to survive? Um, we hope everybody does. I'm just not sure. So I think, um, I think, I guess I could agree that the aspirations are appropriate. Um, the only questions, you know, is is how do we get there? How do we how do we support? How do we achieve those aspirations? Because I think it's a different approach now. Right. And I think it's also worth it's looking at worth looking at um, businesses that have figured out how to make this work a little bit better than mm -hmm. some of the other ones have. And I think um, like I'm, Bailey Road comes to mind. It, Sarah is a phenomenal business owner, and she's done a lot of um, a lot of work in this in between time to try and figure out how to have a better online presence or do. She's been doing like Facebook Live events to sell things, and I, it seems like that's going pretty well for her. But it's I don't know what that looks like longer term. Will she keep doing those things in addition mm. to having her storefront? And is, are those strategies, are there, are there other strategies that we can, that Montpelier could be helping businesses 
uh, adopt that would help make their business more robust, even if things could go back to normal, because it's still, all of those things are still helping it be more sustainable if they have a better online presence, et cetera. I don't know that much about business, but that's how I'm thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, so I guess some of the questions will be, what are the ones, if there are ones to be removed, or is it just a matter of adding more uh, strategies to the, to the pile um, because there are other things to do? Um, you know, a lot of these focus on, you know, um, making a good environment for what I would call the, 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 the built environment of the, the private built environment. So the ability to do projects requires good services. So we've we're, we've got programs laid out in this to help us improve our sewer and water and roads and um, you know make sure that the infrastructure is there. Um, but there is less talking about helping the businesses directly. Um, it's more perhaps the commercial landlords that receive the benefit. And if somebody like Caledonia Spirits owns and operates their own building, they'll receive those benefits too. Um, but well, a lot, a lot of it seems, the strategies seem to focus on continuing programs that were appropriate in the past. And I guess the question is now, are they, are they still appropriate? Or are other programs because of the emergency um, because of, of the changes, are there other programs that we should be including or that might take more precedence even? Um, and uh, like Stephanie, I can't address every, you know, business, business concerns because I feel as if um, maybe we don't have the information. Um, so that was why I was suggesting some kind of a, uh, a new approach, looking at it with a broader group of people. Yeah, we can certainly go back and uh, address or readdress these um, with the new um, with the new folks. I mean, it's, it seems to me like, yeah, you know, based, based on what I've studied before about economic development and economics, uh, it's it's not a great idea for us to try to like s decide where the market's going to go. So you know, and I don't think any of us are like in that in that mindset. I'm just bringing that up as to like just just to post it with something else. It seems like you know the appropriate thing for us to plan for is to just try to make it easier for all businesses to do what's going to happen. Some you know stuff we're not going to be able to predict. Um. And I mean, for instance, I think transitioning from retail stores to restaurants in the downtown is something that I think was going to happen in the next 20 years. Maybe it happens in the next five now. Um, but to restaurants? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, something where like, you know, the Internet doesn't affect that. That is still a local business, you know. Um, anyway, I, I guess I guess what I'm getting at is like what's what's the scope of what of what we have in mind for uh, this recovery idea so I, I agree that it's it's what we can do to support the businesses i would actually disagree about that we're going to become more restaurant oriented since we were 10 years ago we were a lot more restaurant oriented and those are the places that are having the hardest recovery yeah. so you know that's the kind of thing that but we don't have the knowledge to be able to kind of propose that but what are the strategies that at this point given this you know the way the earth is shape has changed um what um what are the strategies that would support the businesses and actually help them move forward that's, that's um, what i'm saying that's what i'm saying i, I mean, think yeah i think we're, that's what we're missing yeah so if I could real quick, I'd, I'd like to dovetail a little bit off of what Kirby just said. I, I, and I agree. I think that, you know, number one, a lot of what's going to impact businesses in Montpelier is going to be the result of larger market forces that are well beyond whatever it is that we codify in a town plan as, a, as an aspirational document going forward for the next eight years. 
and you know and, and the other issue is is you know when push comes to shove you know i it looks to me that this document contains you know aspirations that i think are supportive of any impact that covid might have that's going to extend beyond just the economic portion of this plan i mean the covid impact is going to is going to impact all facets of the town plan you know throughout so that's going to be a thread that binds and we're going to have the same concern um, with that being said is I think Mike has done a very good job of identifying mechanisms that the town has at its disposal that we have empirical evidence that shows that are effective and you know uh, creating efficacy of, for those aspirations that he has laid out there now will you know when revenue and funding uh, you know changes because of COVID is that going to impact the ability for like the tax stabilization program or the TIF program to be as functional as they were before? Sure, absolutely. But I don't know that that's a reason to say that those, that we should not try to uh, continue with those programs, even though they might not be as viable. And more to the point, I think a lot of these strategies that Mike outlining here are flexible enough that I think, and are framed in such a way that it gives flexibility and they, they can still be viable. Things like the designated downtown program, um, the uh, oh, what was it? There was the unified uh, uh, unified development regulations. I mean, there's a whole host of things in here that I think, while things are going to certainly change because of the pot of money that the town's going to be able to draw on, I don't think it's fundamentally. Ch I'm just trying to look through this. I don't see how any of the goals and strategies are really undermined by that funding issue. Um, you know, there's, I think no matter what we do in this plan, given the environment that we're faced with going forward, there's just going to be portions of this town plan that just aren't going to be, you know, they're going to, they're going to fizzle. It's just, I think that's the reality of it. And instead of sort of mining every component of the town plan going forward to try to figure out if how we get a better handle on it, I don't, I think we just need to sort of, I think it would be a good idea right now to just, I'll just say this, like, I think we need to uh, be able to admit to ourselves that we're not going to be able to know the impact of COVID. And if, if we're just not going to today, we're not going to next year, we're not going to fight for that. Um, so I, I do think that while we should be mindful of the COVID impact, I don't know that we want to get ourselves wrapped around the axle of how is this going to impact every facet of the town plan? Because we I don't think any of us have the expertise to really know that. And um, more to the point, you know, if the town plans an aspirational document, I don't know that the aspirations change that much. Um, it's just our ability to sort of effectuate those aspirations. So. What was the last part? I don't think the aspirations change because of COVID. I think that the, the funding was that may come with COVID impacts our ability to, um, to implement those, those, those goals. And some of the programming uh, that we have thought about that might you know, fulfill those goals, that might go away. But I think we're going to see a lot of that across all kinds of facets of the town plan. Things that we thought that, that the town could rely on are going to fall by the wayside. And there's going to be alternatives that come to the fore that are able to do that. I mean, for all we know, there's gonna be like, and I mean, I'm just spitballing here, but there could be significant federal funds coming our way through a stimulus bill. They could, I mean, we just don't know. And so I, I think the measure, I think Mike's done a good job of taking a measured approach using the tools that we know that we have available to us today and that are best situated to effectuate the goals that we've outlined. And so, um, <laughs> I do think for keeping COVID in mind is, is helpful. I just, I, I'm wary of really digging into it uh, really deeply because I just think it, it ends up being a rabbit hole and we never, we'll never get out of it. But it might be the new face of economic development. I think that this particular section is going to be one of the hardest hit, obviously, you know, yeah, it'll impact all sections of the plan, but some much more than others. And this is kind of a prime example of what will be affected. 
and that it may need a change in emphasis in terms of what we're trying to achieve with the plan or how we're going to, um, what strategies we're going to use. Uh, but until we look at it, um, until we see if the city council has a plan um, for moving forward from this, um, it seems as if we need to address it and um, within this document. Uh, well, thanks, Barb, for bringing this up. I mean, I think it's got us all thinking deeply, which is, I guess, the point of our meetings anyway. So thank you very much for, for providing that. Um, what do you think about, I don't know, do you, I mean, I've, I've heard of all the things you've said about what we could do. I mean, what do you think about including a section? Like, would that be something that, like like a, a COVID recovery goal section? I, I know that you, you know, I, I know you're saying that it needs to be a holistic approach uh, but just just throwing that out there as a question right I mean I guess um, oh I really wanted to jump into this um, I guess uh, you know what I, I might want to see happen is to look at the aspirations and actually talk to people who are on the ground who are living through this now and say okay these are the aspirations we're looking at for our city plan um, what do you think? What are we missing? And how can we, what strategy, you know, how can we support this, um, best support this and help you build back out of this significant deficit that you've been thrown into? Um, and, you know, I really think not every section will have to have that kind of a look, but I think economic development does. So I guess what I'm volunteering to do <laughs> is to, um, uh, be in contact with some people, some of the people in this within the city, and uh, if you want me to, if you don't want to do this as a whole commission, um, to kind of um, see what they, you know, what their thoughts are. I just like to get more thoughts on this than just the just the commission um, and the city staff right now. So does that work for you? I mean, it's up to you. It's up to you guys for what you're thinking. I think a lot of what you're talking about is in aspiration C, and so it can always be a, a reshuffling of order of which is A, which is B, which is C. We've done that before, um, but a lot of what you're you're looking at because uh, aspiration C, goal C. So under that aspiration, goal C is maintaining the success of local businesses through retention and expansion programs. Um, is really looking at where I, how do we retain and expand and, you know these covid programs could special special ones could end up within that goal and, and aspiration well also within aspiration b in terms of how do we um how do we attract new private development um given given the way um the world is now it's not going to be in quite the same way. And we may need to, I don't know, provide more handholding, provide more uh, direct uh, assistance if we're serious about wanting to get new private development. Because once we've done so far, you know, it hasn't resulted in a lot of new housing, for example. Um, some, some for sure. But um, so it seems to me that, um, it touches on each of the aspirations. The, the place that we're, we are now is, is sort of affected, has affected each one of those aspirations because it's all about a strong economy. How do we get back to a strong economy? Um, and there would be those, you know, those who argue that we were tenuous, at least the downtown was tenuous before, and now it's even more so. Hey, Mike, where where are the points in the process for public input in the normal course of developing the town plan? We, uh, the way we've laid out this process is to start with the the committees and the interested 
person. So the energy committee developed the energy plan and, and so on. Um, the idea is these would come back to the planning commission, which they are right now, and we would be able to review them. And then, and then we would be, once we've got them pulled together, then we would be starting to go out to get public comment. Um, and that process would take, could take months to go yes. through and have a, have a, a thorough discussion of all of the, the points that are in there really depends once we've got a draft together, um, then I think we start to, to find out where the, the conflict points are, where the support points are, where are we not doing enough? Um, you know, where did the committees and, and planning commission miss the boat on? Um, and I think it's not all that different than the zoning. You know, we wrote a 300 page zoning regulations and spent, you know, the better part of a year and a half in hearings, probably talking about, you know, less than 10 pages of it. Um, and that's, I think the way this will play out as well. If when we did the zoning, I think, you know, we found, we learned a lot of lessons through the whole, that whole process. And I think if we had jumped out and gotten more public input potentially earlier, that might've helped, but the zoning was a much more, um, uh, complex document. It wasn't aspirational in the way that the, the city plan is. The last time we did a city plan, um, I think they got input from s over 600 people. Wasn't that right, Mike? Do you, I mean, I know you weren't here, but um, when, the, uh, when um, the previous plan was put together. Yeah, the, the previous plan is kind of the, the, the kind of the other side of the coin of how we're doing it this time. So the previous plan really went to the public and said, you know, what should we be doing? Um, and kind of had the public develop the strategies that we should be working on. And not all of them were viable strategies. Not all of them were, you know, um, because they aren't, the public isn't an expert in the field. You know, the public knows a very, you know, narrow amount of let's, let's say affordable housing. Everybody may think they know, oh, I know how to fix affordable housing. We'll just do this. And it's like, well, when you talk to affordable housing and housing builders and, and other, you get a, you may get completely different answers that are like, well, those really aren't the barriers. Um, you know, if you listen to the news, it's all about the zoning. You know, zoning is why uh, housing is so expensive and zoning is why housing doesn't get built. And then you go and ask, well, these 15 towns don't have any zoning and they're not building anything and they don't have an answer for it. It's because zoning isn't the reason why housing isn't getting built, it's economics. But if you were to go and ask the public how to fix the affordable housing problem, you may come up with a solution that, you know, and I think a lot of that 2009 plan as, as, as much as there is great value in getting public input, I think there's important, um, there, the public has an important role in establishing certain, um, goals and visions and really going out and um, reviewing and understanding how we're going to go through it. But I think the development of strategies and the task I was given was really to develop a more strategic plan. The previous plan was 500 pages long without, you know, as much um, substance, you know, a lot of encouraging things, a lot of things that said, we're going to do X, and it's going to be done, you know, um, we're going to get more demand management for, um, to, to, to reduce the number of single vehicle occupancies. Um, we're going to get businesses to, to encourage carpooling. And that's it. And you're kind of like, well, that's, that's not a strategy. That's just, that's just an, an outcome we would like to see, but that's not a strategy. We had a lot of those in the current plan. So this one was really meant to be, let's start thinking about, all right, what are, what are we going to do to make that happen? And um, so I think that's, that's a little bit of the difference. That's why we're starting with the committees and the experts to say, okay, we know what the goals are. Let's talk about the strategies. And when we've got that, we'll go to the public and get that input. And yeah, I was totally on board with that. Tell me I'm wrong. 
No, you're, you're, you're right. And this is, you're right that this is the other side of the coin from what was done before. And I was totally on board with that um, until COVID. Um, now I'm, I just think that there's going to be a need for more public involvement earlier. And especially because many of the committees, as far as I know, are not meeting. Um, and so it's not as if there's sort of that continuity with all the committees who are, have been putting together these plans, these sections of the city plan. Um, and I'm just worried too, that we might get into a situation which we did with the zoning is that we end up with a document that we take to the, to the city um, and the, the residents say, this isn't, but you didn't get public input. Um, and um, at some point, it's, I, I just feel that maybe because the conditions have changed, we might need to get input earlier. But certainly at this point, my feeling about this particular section is we need to get input from more of the people who are on the ground and actually seeing what's happening. Well, my understanding was that the next step for all of these chapters was going to be public input. I mean, we're doing our first review, right? Like this is the, the first step in the process is the subcommittees. The second step is us taking a look and kind of organizing things further. And then the third step was going to be the first round of public input. Is that, that is that correct, Mike? Yeah, we're going to, we're going to keep moving together on getting this, the things together and then start to get the, the public input and start, we were supposed to have somebody come on board to help me this summer to draft some of the chapters, um, which wasn't going to be as hard as it's not, they're not going to be as long as the previous plan chapters were. So I don't think it was going to be as hard. Unfortunately, we've lost that help, but um, yes, that is still the plan to then get public input on the goals and strategies and start drafting chapters. Yeah. So, um, I would still like to get a few more of them How under our we, belt. Uh, okay. Does that sound okay, Barb? I mean, I'm sorry. Does what sound okay? Do we do we put some of the chapters out for public input soon? Well, yeah, but I don't think this chapter is appropriate to put out for public input at this stage because we don't have enough input right now from the people who are actually doing economic development or trying to recover from the economic catastrophe that's happened. Um, so it, it, uh, so you said you I were going to reach, you were going to do some outreach and, and talk to some of these, the people that you have in mind and you'll come back and report back to us. Like, well, if I have, if I have support from the commission, I will do that. Um, but, um, I think it's great. Does anybody else uh, have an opinion on our doing that? I support that. I think that's a good idea. I don't quite understand if the next if the next step in the process is to solicit public input on the chapter, and the argument is, is that we're not ready for public input yet. The proposed solution is to go and try to solicit input from members of the public. No, from, from people who are knowledgeable in the field, the people who are actually doing the economic development in the city right now in the recovery effort. So, no, I'm not just going to go, you know, I would not just go out to the public in general. Why can't, um, why can't we just because I just don't feel that right now this, this, um, this particular chapter could, is quite appropriate yet to send out to the public. Why can't we just solicit their input during the public comment phase? It's too late. Because we're talking about something that might happen six months down the road. We've got a lot of other chapters in the way, right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot more, um, you know, and I mean, that that's where some of the question comes up about COVID. We, we just don't know 
how this is going to play out over time. I mean, this plan won't be adopted till, you know, 2021 at the best. And, you know, we have no idea sitting here now whether COVID runs its course and things bounce back. We lose a couple of businesses, we gain a couple of businesses and, you know, it's not as good as it was, but we're back to, to moving forward. We, we, or is it really, there's a, a there's a, a fundamental shift that needs to happen in economic development and we need to start applying our resources in a different way. Um, and I don't know that, and I don't think we'll we'll know that for for some time. Um, I do know a lot of there's been very limited amount of work that that so far the city as as via the city council has done, other than to loosen up some rules when it comes to parklets and uh, doing some sidewalk stuff. But most of the other issues and things have been addressed directly through MDC fundraising and those types of initiatives. Um. Right. So maybe maybe a way to move forward is to move on to some of the other sections. I will do some background on this and get back to you um, next month. But if you if we can put this on hold for right now, um, I know that there are other other sections that you have ready to go. Right, Mike? Uh, not not that many. We've got a bunch that are closed, but I can't move them on because, you know, Transportation Committee is almost done, but they're not meeting. Um, I did meet with the Parks Commission last week, and so I'm going to be putting together part, which is a, a part of the community services. So I'm going to start trying to put together community services, um, which is going to be a big, a big chunk because there's a lot. There's Senior Center, there's Rex, there's Park, there's... Um, uh, I know we have most of a draft for natural resources, but again, I got to get Conservation Commission to start meeting again. You should have most of a draft for energy, right? And I think energy is actually done. I think you guys approved energy, didn't you? I think so. Oh, I guess. Um, yeah, I think housing, energy, and historic resources are done. I, I thought we had some so. adjustments to energy, but go ahead. Right. So I don't think I didn't think any of them were done. Well, specifically, but <laughs> right. They, still... yes, they've been given the first review like this. Got it. It's, yeah. Gone through, because yeah, I, I also gone... think I think if our intention is to have something that's presentable for public consumption so that they can provide feedback, I think this format's going to be really hard for people to digest. And so we've talked about I don't know that we've really figured out how these chapters are or how the strategies are going to look um, so that they can actually be much more digestible. Uh, and, and to figure out how we talked, we also talked about looking at all the different chapters together and figuring out where, where we had specific um, junctures of things. So where certain things that come up a lot like housing and uh, affordable housing specifically and being able to find what those key things were looking at all the chapters together and, highlight that those are the things that we're most interested in doing. So I think that the presentation is going to be challenging. Um, and I don't know that we've really figured out what that looks like. So actually, I take that back. It looks like energy still, still, it's been completed. So energy would be the next one we would take up as a planning commission. So energy is done. You guys haven't seen it, so. Um, so we could move forward on those. And, and I agree, energy. Stephanie, it, it seems like so long ago, but we did talk about trying to create a sort of more digestible um, format for public consumption. Right. I think John Adams might have had some ideas about that, too. And mm -hmm. we, yeah, we have a discussion about a website. Yeah, we have approval to do um, the, the, the storyboards. We, we have um, Stone Environmental has been working with us. We've got a bunch of the materials to be able to do these storyboards for each chapter. Um, we're going to digest them down to about 1,500 words. Um, most of that conversation is to kind of discuss and lead up to why our aspirations are. Why, why is this our aspiration for housing or for energy? 
and really to kind of give people, um, nobody reads these big long plans, um, but what we want to be able to do is to create a web format that people are willing to go in and look at and be able to read, and there'll be a number of links that will let them, if you're interested in more, here's the, the barriers to housing report, here's the, um, you know, here are a number of different reports that you can link on and open up. But in general, we're going to talk a lot about, you know, we're going to try to tell everything that people would want to know in about 1,500 words. And that would fit on that one storyboard web page with graphics. You know, try to be graphic rich, try to be, um, have those types of links um, to try to get people on. Okay, so so for for time management purposes, let's um, can can we sketch out a tentative idea here? I know I hear what you're saying, Barb. That you you think that it's possible that things could get blown up, given new information that you that you bring out. Um, I, I mean, I think we're this is all we plan for tonight. It's all Mike's ready for. Like, I think that we should go through and at least give our ideas of the draft that's in front of us, um, and and also. I, I, you know, we're in favor of you going and, do, and getting, doing further research. In general, to the Planning Commission, by the way, I I've, have a perspective that it's never a bad idea for any of us to go out and solicit more information from our community. I think that's a transparent thing. And I think I always don't, I don't like it when I hear in government of people thinking that that's a bad idea because of, you know, legal stuff or bureaucracy or something like I've always been, you know, against that. So I think we should all go out and talk to the community and come back and report that stuff. I know I've done it. If you remember the arts and culture thing, I went and spoke with a couple of artists to get some ideas about how we could proceed with that. And, you know, I just did it. Um, so I think it's great for anyone to, to feel free to, to do that and report back to us and to know that we're always going to be open to hearing, you know, feedback that you gather, you know, this isn't a scientific process where we have to follow some particular, you know, format or something. So, uh, so with that, yeah, I, I, it'd be great if Barb does that. I think that we can go ahead and look at, at what, what's in front of us now to see what people's reactions are uh, with the, you know, understanding that there could be impacts, especially in the next few years from this. So, uh, what do you think, Mike? Should we should we walk through it, or uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's helpful to walk through it. Certainly, you know, if Barb's going to be out chatting with people about it, it's helpful to you know to, to understand this. This is a this is a draft. We've put things together. I put things together, knowing that it's going to get pushed and pulled. And as long as people understand, this is this is not a plan that we have together that we put together that we're looking for public input on that it's more it's it's a little bit softer than that this is just these are the things this is what we've come up for aspirations and if this is our aspiration we've broken them into goals and this is how we plan to accomplish those individual goals through strategies now if somebody goes through and says that shouldn't be a goal or that should be a lower priority goal um that's, that's what we want. I just don't want people to get a sense that this is our pro quote proposal or this is staff's proposal. This is, I'm putting things together so that way people, it's easier for people to react to something than it is for me to go to the public and say, help me write a plan. A lot easier for me to put stuff together, hear back from the public that goes and says, that was good. This should be changed. Um, and, and so I think from the standpoint of, us going through it right now, yes, I think it's valuable for us to go through it. So Barb has a sense of where there's support on the planning commission. Of, I think these areas are in the right direction. Maybe these areas need more work. Okay. So what are, what are everyone's thoughts about um, the aspiration A and the goals? Uh, before we before we get there, um, the description up above, as of fiscal of 2020, this includes, and then it says to be filled in later. It's all um, the highlighted parts. The highlighted parts have not been updated. 
All right. Okay. So those would definitely have to be since, yeah. Um, in fact, even the level of funding, we don't know what that's going to be. So um, that will change is what you're saying. Yeah, we tried. I try to capture so people can understand the context of what are we doing already. So when we talk about housing, what are we doing already? So we'll have a thing that goes through and says, well, we have a housing task force. We have a housing trust funds committee. We have uh, Kevin's position as community development specialist. We have um, the trust fund is funded at $100,000 a year. Um, it gives people a sense of, oh, okay, so we are doing something. Um, and this is this gives a context. So I haven't filled in these highlighted pieces. And obviously, yes, it, the, the $100,000 for MDC, it was a five-year commitment. And I think this is the last year they have that commitment. And the question is going to come up, what happened in 2022? Um, and that's an open question for everybody. But right now, that's what MDC gets. I also know Montpelier Alive gets a number of funding sources, um, including DID. So I don't have those numbers specifically. But they have some resources. I mean, because considering it says that... Uh that Mike's office is responsible for this chapter and then the other things mentioned, the other entities mentioned are, you know, supportive. I mean, I'm not too hung up on giving detail because they're not, a, they're not an essential part of, of the chapter anyway, based on the way it's written. No, it just should be accurate. So are you suggesting not including that part Kirby? No, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's fine for Mike to go in later and to get to fill in some details, but um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, a very important part of the chapter though. Well, I actually thought that, um, I don't know if we're moving on, but mm -hmm. um, I thought it would be nice to have actually aspiration C be the first aspiration, maintain a strong, strong job market, get living wages. Um, to me, that's a little bit more, I don't know, the fundamental sort of more exciting, I guess, uh, aspiration. Because I feel like aspiration A is like we're creating this place to, that's attractive to come to. Um, and, you know, aspiration B is kind of about infrastructure, but aspiration C to me seems like the exciting part. So that's just my thought. Um, and I also noticed that they're just, you know, as with other chapters, they're just strategies that are repeated for many different goals and how we deal with that. Yeah, and the repeated strategies will get fixed when we, this is a kind of a working strategic plan. When we get to the final version, it'll be structured differently. So that way we aren't repeating them over and over again. But yeah, we certainly could move the aspiration C to aspiration A. Um, you know, as I said, we I think we did that in the housing chapter because we felt that I think affordable housing landed in the last goal and people wanted that move to the first goal. I, I agree with that move for what it's worth. Sure. Seems seems fine by me. It's kind of putting people up front is the way I see it. So is there a hierarchy to these aspirations, Mike? Not technically. Usually they're talking, they're just talking about different things. Um, you know, there's just a lot of different ways of looking at something as intricate or as complicated as economic development, we could talk about, um, you know, even in a big picture, we can talk about, you know, uh, 
uh, we can talk about economic development where we focus on, on, on labor, or we can talk about management. Um, you know, there's just, and a lot of economic development plans talk about, you know, businesses and helping businesses, but don't really focus on employees, you know, um, uh, workforce training is economic development. Um, but a lot of times you won't see workforce training and education and, and re-education of, of the workforce. Um, so, um, you know, this is a key component of the cities is to, is to really talk about, you know, the, the impacts on, on the employees, living wages. Um, and so I think that's, that's a good place to start. Talk about, talk about the people, keep the focus on, on the employee, keep the focus on the people and talk about the other pieces other, uh, afterwards. But economic development is also the, you know, the, the, the landlords and the actual physical infrastructure and, and those pieces. And then, and then you get kind of get up to the 50,000 foot, which is why A was really there, was kind of getting up to the more, you know, what, what, what is our economic strategy? It's kind of more of a fuzzy, fuzzy thing while well, ours is looking at the unique downtown and those and that can certainly fall second um, and could could fall third if we want to adjust all three of the you know reverse the order of a b and c because B is looking at the businesses themselves. And, you know, so that's kind of looking at the second layer and the, the, the 50,000 foot layer is, is currently goal A. We can just reverse the order of A, B, and C. That's actually, I was, that's what I was thinking is reversing them. I think in part because aspiration A is gonna be the area where we're hitting on things that are in a lot of other chapters. Um, B and C right now are the two that are most relevant to specifically just this chapter. I think under A, we're going to run into a lot of things that are also like the housing goals um, and the sense of place sort of things. I think those will come up elsewhere. Yeah, and that's why in A, you see a lot of connections to other plans. And that's basically because that's it's the really the visionary 50,000 foot view, which is why it you know, we support the, um, the community services plan and we support the transportation plan and we support the housing plan and we support the energy plan. It's, it's just that level of, of degree. And maybe that's not the first one, the best one to start out with. So yeah, we can switch those. Yeah, it might be nice to get more immediacy to it by having um, aspiration C be the first one. That gives it kind of a more immediate business-related emphasis. Okay, I can make that, that adjustment. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, does anyone else have any feedback? Uh, we can go, we can start going back. Well, uh, now that the order's different, we can go with aspiration C, which is the new A. Uh, so reading through that, I mean, there's quite a lot there. There's quite a lot of, um, you know, I don't have strong opinions on these things, but I definitely have some, I don't know. Uh, I'm curious about some things such as like a, having a focus on living wages. Does, isn't that just like a, a different way of have, like just prioritizing different industries? Like some industries like just don't pay living wages very well, like retail. And that's, that's the trick. And that was the hard part I had in putting this together is I was looking at what had been the goals and what are the goals of city council 
And they had a strong emphasis on wanting to create more jobs or to have more jobs with living wages. And so the question is, all right, as a city, how do we do that? You know, um, Seattle or these other larger metropolises can come in and establish their own minimum wage. You know, we can't do that in Montpelier. It's, it's not in our charter. We can't do it anyways. And it probably wouldn't work on a town this small. So how are we going to accomplish that goal? And again, that's, this, this goes back to our fundamental when we were talking about being strategic. Um, we now have a goal. It's pretty clear what they want. We want more people earning living wages. Now the question is, how are we going to do that? So some is to, you know, uh, as I put in here, amend incentive programs such as TIF, tax stabilization and economic development revolving loan fund, which have been talked in other places, to apply only to businesses that provide living wages. That's an option. Um, right now, it's only a, it's, it's, you can get certain points. You can still get tax stabilization without paying living wage, um, but you can get more tax stabilization if you pay a living wage. So, you know, I, I think that's our best spot to look at it. But I also put in there the other strategy. So I really only had two strategies. One was let's study how many jobs and in what sectors do not receive living wages and identify programs and incentives to encourage businesses to provide them. Because I think that's the best we can do. Because right now, we, I don't have an answer. I, do, I can't look at the literature and come up with a good way that says, here's how we can either force people to do it or strongly encourage people to do it, except through having programs like tax stabilization to say, hey, you, you want a tax stabilization? Great, but you got to pay a living wage. And if you don't pay a living wage, you don't get it. Uh, but, I'm not... So I'm not opposed to that idea. I think that might make sense. I'm not completely sure, but I think from my perspective, given the size of Montpelier, I think as a as a culture of people, the people of Montpelier, we that's something that we care about, I think. But I, I think it's more important for us to be focusing on how do we make sure that our businesses are viable. And if our businesses are viable, or if we can't, if we can't have viable businesses that we're supporting within the city, they're not going to be able to pay a livable wage. So how do we make sure that we're I, I would look at it from the opposite perspective, I guess, and say that this is what comes next when you have businesses that can be viable. Yeah, and I think that would maybe go a little bit into goal B, which is to look at the um, encouraging and supporting the businesses. Um, right. And I think I, I think A was just look trying to trying to come up with those strategies because it is something whether it's Connor, whether it was Ashley when she was on there. Um, there's just a number of them that really go through and, and have a sense that <clears throat> there are a lot of people that are, that are making, making money and doing, doing well in business and um, not sharing that wealth with their employees. And whether that's true or not, I'm just saying, you know, reading, reading into what I hear from, from various folks, that's been the sense. And I think we just have to look at, um, if, if that is their goal, um, the living wages, then I think, I think that's, that would be the next appropriate step is to study it. And another piece of that is if businesses aren't viable without it, then, then what, um, you know, are, are we just encouraging living wages where it's appropriate? I think we need to have a better, I think the city council has to have a more complete picture um, so they can establish their policies clearly. Um, I know what their goal is. They would like everybody, you know, even retail to make the, the, the $15 an hour or $14 an hour. But whether that's viable in this economy, I don't know. I think, I think the reality is you'd have a hard time living in Montpelier if you make $15 an hour anyway. Unless you, unless you have subsidized housing. I mean, it, for us, for our community, it, it's unique in that it's cost of living is actually what's out of control more than a, than a wage problem. Uh, uh, shows how these things are all connected.
so well, I, I did want to go and take a look at this uh, below that under goal B. I tried to lay out um, that first strategy, develop and adopt the policy that focuses on economic, um, focuses our economics, that our focus of our economics should be, and has like what, maybe eight points. I think that's too many. I mean, I don't think it's very, we're being very strategic and focused, um, but this captures all of the various points that I've heard from different people. Um, and I wasn't going to remove remove them, but I think it's worthy of going through, um, you know, uh, one of our keys is maintaining and supporting the functions of state government. I mean, 3,000 of the people that, of people that work here, 3,000 employees work for the state, and I think that's an important part of our economy. Um, Can you explain that one a little bit more, Mike? Um, how are we supporting them now? And if we're going to maintain our support, then we have to have an idea of how we're supporting them now. Well, we've got a lot of certainly with our, our um, emergency services. Um, we used to do more oh, uh, coordination thanks. between them. Um, certainly when we start talking about, um, you know, the parking, you know, the amount of parking that the state employees, I mean, it's just a, there are a lot of uh, pieces. And I know I got a lot of pushback from CVEDC and a couple of the other economic folks, um, not the current ones, but previous ones, when I had talked about this, when we developed the EDSP, we talked about, it's important for us to make sure we are a good partner for the state um, because they could move their jobs to other communities. They could, move employees to Waterbury. And we want to be a good neighbor and a good partner with them because they provide 3,000 really good paying jobs. And um, for some reason, the economic development folks that I was working with didn't want us, didn't want our focus to be, you know, you don't base your economy on, on supporting state government. And I'm like, you do when they're providing... <laughs> When they're providing more than fifty percent of your jobs and they're really good paying jobs, yes, you do. Yeah, um, and especially now, given we want to draw them back here, so what are we doing to support them for that so that those people will come back and not remote continue to work remotely? Yes. Yeah, so that that was where I was going with you know that's that's our bread and butter is we can do a lot with our economy um, if we can maintain a good working relationship with the state government and the state, you know, um, state workers, um, maintaining the support of businesses that support the function of the state. So in other words, we've got to recognize that being the capital, we've got to support those nonprofits and those lobbyists and those other ones. And there may not be much that we need to do to physically actually support them, but you know, you kind of have this 3000 employees and you got the people that are supporting the state, um, We've got another strong sector. Finance and insurance has always been a strong sector of our economy, um, National Life and a number of other insurance companies. But then we start getting to a few of these other ones. So those I think are no brainers, those first three. The next ones are the ones that start getting a little bit farther out there. The EDSP talked about growing our food processing and specialty manufacturing sectors, businesses like Caledonia Spirits. Um, we invested, the city invested a lot of money in helping Caledonia Spirit happen, you know, and should we be putting money towards those types of um, ventures? It grew our grand list a lot. I think, I think it was a good investment on our part. It grew a number of living wage jobs. Um, it grew our grand list. Um, but again, it's a policy where we have only a limited amount of money. Where should we put the money? Um, we've gotten a push from the parks folks to look at growing our recreation sector, um, which would mean, you know, and again, it's how do we spend our money? If our focus is going to be on being a recreational center, then that means we've got to put our money into completing our complete streets plan. So we've got on-road biking and our parks and off-road biking. You've got to, that's where we would invest money. Um, so again, it's about how we invest our money. I don't think we can do 
all of these pieces, grow our professional business and technological services like engineers, lawyers, accountants, and environmental services. Again, that's a, that's a good idea, but can we invest in all three of those? And then if we wanna talk about growing our tourism and hospitality and art sectors based on our recreational arts, culture, and food. Another, another great idea, but can we do all of these and growing specialty retail? Um, again, I think this is just, it's just some of our conversation. I put all the pieces together from the EDSP. I think for a city of 8,000, we're trying to be too much. Now, the basis of a lot of these comes from the fact that we have very expensive land, very expensive rents. So what we're trying to do or what our EDSP developer wanted us to be doing is focusing on things that could afford to pay our rents. Um, that's why we're talking about specialty retail, um, uh, food processing and specialty manufacturing. Because if somebody is going to be doing general manufacturing, they're going to go to the Barry, Barry Town business parks. They're going to go to Barry City where land is cheap, rents are cheap because that's general, but specialty manufacturing looks for places like Montpelier. That's why Caledonia Spirits is here. If Caledonia Spirits wanted to save a lot of money, they would have located in Barry City. They could have saved a bunch of money, but it's a specialty and they wanted to be here in Montpelier. Um, so again, that's a little bit of the background of why they were recommended to be our targets, but I think at some point, I think we need to go through and either rank these or, you know, I think that might go, Barb, to your conversation with some of the, the people who are working specifically is, all right, what's, what's our focus going to be? Um, you know, where, where are we going with our downtown? Um, because as we set up our focus, the downtown should fill in to fit that niche that we're trying to grow, you know, and assuming we pick the right niche then it should grow, then, then, you know, obviously if you pick the wrong one, you know, and I think some of these are going to be tough growing our recreational sector. We've got a lot of competition. We're going to have to really separate ourselves in some way from why would people come here and not Warren or Waitsfield or Stowe or Smuggler's Notch or Berry Town? You know, I, I don't want to be the, you know, the downer on it, but boy, we're going to have to have something that's going to set ourselves apart. We're, you know, stay here because you can do this and, and go to a great dinner at night um, and have, you know, I think we, we need to put a package together that, that makes that a good selling point, unless we're just talking about having great recreational sector for the locals to use. But I, I don't see us being able to support an entire sector just on the people that live in town. So, and I don't expect the answers tonight. I just wanted people, I wanted people to focus on that one. I think that's an important one for us to have conversations about. So what are, what are some um, ideas for moving some of these things along? Like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like, uh, I guess some of the professional business type stuff, if we want to help that, we could allow those things to be put in more places. I mean, what else, what else can we do? Um, I think some of this comes back to how we spend our money um, or our tax stabilizations. We tend to give tax stabilizations for a lot of things, but we could certainly go through and say, you know, we're only going to give tax stabilizations for, um, for businesses that meet one of our eight priorities. Um, so if somebody comes in and decides they're going to do something that's not one of these priorities, then they're just not eligible for a tax stabilization. Are we giving out a lot of tips? I didn't realize that. The tax stabilizations, we, we get them. There's not a lot. Usually it only applies to oh, oh. new projects getting built. So you'll have to look at um, Caledonia Spirits got one. Um, uh, the old armory at just past the roundabout, they got one. Fred Connor built that project. He put an addition on the back, so that got a tax stabilization. Um, and, you know, they come up from time to time. I can think of 
Um, yeah. Another one of Fred's projects on 302. Think of a new building that's built that will probably try to come in and get um, a tax stabilization for it. Yeah. So, sorry for bringing up tips there. I, I confused myself. Okay. Yeah. Just just tax stabilization. Okay. So but we a, could apply it. We could apply it to TIF, even though I think that would maybe not necessarily be a, a good idea. But you you could technically go and tell somebody, you know, if your project isn't building, you know, um, if you're if you're building a project that's unaffordable housing or is something not on this list, we're, you know, you can extend the sewer all you want, pay for it yourself. Um, you're in the TIF district, but we're not going to use TIF to support your project. It seems like being more permissive and not more strict is the way to get more businesses in. Yeah, you know, it just depends if you've limited limited resources and how you want to apply them. And so, Mike, are you thinking that with these eight points that um, you would want us to sort of consider a hierarchy on on who we would really be, what our focus is, and who we would be most appealing to? Uh, it could be it could be a focus. Um, I mean, I some of it is going to come down to this is going to be a priority, and if this is going to be a priority, then why must follow? Um, let me take you out of Montpelier and give you a different example. So we've um, when I was working with Hardwick on their plan years ago. Um, the discussion came up, if you wanted to, if you were going to focus on agricultural products, which they were, you know, we want to have these agricultural industrial parks, we want to have these um, ag innovator um, processing, it's actually what Caledonia Spirits in, came out of that in, in Hardwick, but there are a lot of products that came out of that, that brainstorming that was there, um, separate from my work, um, that was already going on. But we had a conversation that if, if agriculture is going to be your focus, then you're going to need to also, um, as a secondary thing, start to focus on um, where is the conservation and what do we have for the farmland? Because if we then grow out our, this entire agricultural economy on, on um, ag processing, and then a farmer turns around and decides he's going to sell out to a housing developer. Well, you're not just the impact of losing farms to housing development is going to have an impact, a trickle down impact on everybody who relies on the products that were produced by on that land. Now you'd hope that the value added industries would keep the farms going, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes farmers need, you know, as, as much as they're doing things, they, they don't, they, there's their health, there's other things that may come up that go and say, look, I, I've got to sell my farm because I can't, you know, I don't have the health insurance and, you know, I've got big bills, I've got to sell out and, you know, I'm going to get more money selling it to this housing developer. Well, we've got to think about that if we're going to invest a lot of city money in value added industries. If we then don't at least think about what are we going to do to make sure that the, the land that supports these value added industries, because if we lose the land, these industries all go down as well. Um, and so that's some of the connection. That's why I pointed out a little bit when we talk about if, if our focus is going to be on this recreation economy, then we've got to start maybe prioritizing how do we invest our money in our grant in our in our capital improvement plan because if that's going to be a focus we that's where we want to go we want to go with this we think it's going to generate more jobs then we've got to spend money putting in the bike lanes because it doesn't do us any good to try to bring in a lot of people if we've got disconnected bike routes and um, you know it's kind of like if we want that to be our focus then we've got to stick our money here rather than investing in something else um, and I think that's where some of the picture comes in of you know, it's not necessarily direct outreach to Onion River Sports to say, how can we get money to Onion River Sports? Some of it may be um, helping that sector by doing what we're supposed to do. Um, 
building out the green print so that way these trails connect across the town. Um, that's going to cost money and that's going to take time and that's going to take resources. But if we want it, if that's going to be the focus of our, our economics, then we need to invest money in making the, the infrastructure support that economic goal. Yeah, I think your point here is a good one because we do seem like we're stretched too thin and we're trying to be everything for everybody. And, um, you know, it, it, we, don't, we don't have the funds or the resources to do that. So by prioritizing, at least, that might help. Um, and yeah, we've got, I mean, we really do have, for a city our size, a lot of great recreation um, um, uh, parks and Hubbard Park and, and bike lane. But, um, you know, is that our focus? And I think, you know, we, if we could prioritize, that would help. Yeah, and I'm not trying to put which one should be. I'm just saying if, 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 if people say that's, that's the priority, then my next thing would be, well, then you've got to put your money in this place. Yeah. Um, and if you don't, then you're just setting yourself up for not having it work out well. Or as well as it could. Um, You know, uh, you know, growing our tourism and hospitality sectors, you know, that that falls a lot back to building the hotel. And, you know, we're not going to build the hotel, but we can build the parking garage that supports the hotel. Um, you know, they're different. It, it, it depends. How do we want to spend it? And while we're not putting a lot of our our money into the parking garage, we are investing a lot of time and we could we could put that that staff effort in other places. Um, but again, I think. You know, if you were to ask me, my opinion is I think um, the, the, the tourism would be a strong sector that would support the downtown. Um, I think it, it, would, it would support a number of these other goals um, by having a strong, a strong sector in, in the tourism and hospitality. I think we already have it. I think we can strengthen what we have. Right, and these things also relate, like Caledonia Spirits is definitely a draw to things like the food processing, especially manufacturing is a tourism draw. Whereas I think a lot of the, I, I don't know how many people come in to Montpelier for recreation. I think based on the towns, my husband's on the park commission, he can hear me right now, but uh, yeah. based on the towns around us, I think there are other towns that have better um, recreation in terms of being a draw for tourism than we do well we don't have a ski mountain that's true but um but i when we were at caledonia spirits there were a number of people who came in who had biked there because they had a bike path that they could use to get there yeah so and they you know that that was a real draw for them so um yeah i mean i think it gets into um a lot of complexity I mean, our support for um, for the hospitality industry, you know, when we still don't have a facility that can handle a conference of any size. I mean, given that we're the state capital, I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that where we haven't supported it in the past. And so we need to decide how important we think that is. Yeah, it's why we haven't had the Vermont Beer Fest or any of those larger festivals, they just, yeah. you know, and, and uh, you know, the, the number of things that are lost, um, Norwich University for graduations, people tend to stay in hotels in Waterbury because there just isn't room in Montpelier. And it's just, I think it's just a loss for us to have people drive through Montpelier on their way to Waterbury because there's not, not enough hotel space. And I think we could benefit in a number of ways by having, um, you know, capturing people who are coming in to, to um, protest or, or voice their opinions on things, um, having the ability to have space for people to be here. Um, I think it's a benefit all the way around, but, but again, I think you're right. I, my, my concern is, I think we're, we're trying to focus in too many places <clears throat> and I think it would be helpful for us to, you know, we, we know we've got our big two or three um, 
right off the top with the with the state and the functions that support the state, the nonprofits and lobbyists, and finance and insurance. I don't think we have to do a lot to help them. They're all very successful, but I think we have to be a good partner for them. Once we get below that, I think we need to start going through and prioritizing because that's where we need to invest. I don't think these just happen organically. The top three are gonna, are gonna succeed because of who they are. Uh, we just have to be a good partner. I think things below it, I think we have to do a better job of prioritizing what our focus is going to be. So we make sure that we're investing capital dollars, programs in the right direction to help them. I think, I think the professional businesses go with the top three as well. I think that they also kind of take care of themselves as long as we allow it to happen. There's this, there's this psychologist that keeps trying to buy my house. Um, they want to, <laughs> I mean, that's just one example, but I think they, they come in and they, they want to be here uh, the same as the, the others, the, the top ones. It's, I think it's what do we prioritize and what are, what are things that can support more than one of these things so that we can do, how do we maximize um, whatever our investment ends up being. And we don't have to answer that here. I'm just throwing that out there as things for us to chew on. Mm -hmm. um, Well, I hate to say it, but I have to um, sign off here in the next couple of minutes. Um, is there anything in particular that you want us to look at other than that particular portion of it, Mike? Or just basically the whole thing? Um, I would, I mean, once we've reshuffled C up front to A, and I can make that reshuffling and get that back out to you guys later this week. I would, I would think most of the focus would be on this section C that's now going to be A. Um, because I think many of the pieces of B are helping, are, are helping the, the, the landlords and the commercial landlords. And I think those are valuable, but I think most of those get to your point earlier that you were talking about, Barb, of the continuing. I don't think there's a lot of new things we need to be doing to help those. We've got, this, we've got, those, we've got the pieces there to help. You know, if you want to build a new building, we've got the tools to help you. Um, I think where there, there, are, there are going to be things, it's going to be in C. And I think, as I said, I think, I don't think A now moved to C. I think it's, yes. that's more fuzzy and amorphous. I don't think, I mean, people are welcome to review any of the pieces and give their input, but I think most of what I would focus on, if people said, I don't have time for this, go and say, you know, look at the new A. The um, new A. Tell us, tell us what you think. And living wages comes directly out of the city council goals. And you've got to figure out, we, I have to figure out as, as staff, how do I, how do I help city council accomplish their goals? What can I recommend for strategies? And I personally don't have good strategies. If people have ideas for strategies, I'd love to hear them. Um, and then we want to continue to improve business and climate. And then we want to maintain and enhance the success of local businesses through retention and expansion. So we're kind of got the three goals, that one that one aspiration, three goals, and a whole set of, of strategies to accomplish each one of those. Um, okay, sorry, I'm, I've got to take off here. Um, but I've got a conflicting, conflicting agreements here tonight. So thanks for uh, Thanks for all this work on this, Mike. It certainly can get us started. Um, are you anticipating having energy for next time then? So our next meeting is three weeks from now and it will be the public hearing on um, zoning. So we'll see what we hear. So I'm gonna put on the agenda is gonna have um, the public hearing and then secondarily, um, I'll put the energy plan on. Okay. Unless, yeah. people, okay. unless people want to revisit economic development, I can put the energy plan on. And if we have time, we get to it. If we don't have time, we don't get to it. 
I think I think what we need to do because it's going to be a while before you revisit this, and that'll give Barb some time to get some feedback and, and report back to us. Because yeah, our next meeting is definitely not going to involve this. Um, I think while it's fresh in everyone's mind, if we can spend these last ten minutes, like letting Mike know what other direction we have in mind, um, because. I don't know how else we're going to share information about this chapter in the near future because, and also follow open meeting laws. So I, well, I guess what I'm saying is like, let's- um, can, I send, can I send things yeah. out through Mike, Kirby? Um, well, I was thinking like a, maybe, a, maybe a month or like either, either not next meeting, but the meeting after that or the either two or three meetings from now, you can report back to us during okay. the meeting. Uh, okay. and, and, but, but Mike would also, is also going to be working on this, um, in the meantime. So I think now is our chance to let him know things like, for instance, you know, like I, I guess my feedback for you, Mike, on what we were just talking about is I think it sounds like supporting, um, a conference and hotel infrastructure sounds like a good focus if we're going to try to prioritize something. Um, and, and do other people have other thoughts to share with him while we're still here for the next 10 minutes. Okay, I gotta go. Um, thanks for, you, thanks for all your work. Thanks, Barb. Yeah. Thanks, Barb, see ya. See ya. So do we have, do we have any, any other ideas? I mean, uh, touch on the living wage. Does anyone have anything they want to see for the next time we revisit this? I don't, I don't have anything major. Just what I already shared, so nothing. I mean, for the, for the living wage stuff, it seems like maybe if, if you're not going to be heavy handed anyway, I mean, something to do with Montpelier Alive or some sort of celebration of businesses promoting businesses that offer a living wage or something like that like a mm -hmm. social pressure kind of approach which i think could be pretty effective in montpelier actually yeah yeah probably. I mean, montpelier like now stickers if you pay all of your employees a living wage you can put a sticker i don't know right <laughs> yeah it's, a lot of those you'd be surprised how some of those um end up working i know when i was in in grad school it was a big push to have um, uh, my graduate, one of my graduate advisors was working on labeling, doing some of the first labeling for sustainable harvest of, of wood products. And it was just, you know, it's, it's not mandatory, but it gives you a value added. If you, if you can get third party certified, which is what they were setting up mm -hmm. as sustainable harvest, then you might be able to get a better wage in the market because, or be better rates in the market because people are willing to pay a little bit more to know that they're getting a, a you know, an environmentally responsible product. And you see it a lot now. And I've always been surprised. I'm like, that was, you know, I see, I see the stamp on, on wood products now when I go to the, um, to the lumber yard, and I, I just can think back. This, this was just an idea. This guy was was, was pushing that people would actually pay a little bit more, and now you almost find him everywhere. But same I idea. I think that's a great idea. But if that's, yeah, if that's what city council wants to prioritize, if that's the thing they care the most about, I think that's a really good way to go about it. Anyone else have any more thoughts uh, <clears throat> about the chapter? Okay, then. Well, I guess we'll leave it there and we'll all have to uh, get ready for uh, the hearing. I, it's been a long time, Mike, since we um, have talked about the development review process. Uh, would it be possible for you to since, since an outline or something about what we should expect for next time. I think that'll help the meeting go much better. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can get um, Meredith to come to the meeting again because she had her presentation. Maybe she'll be able to come to help. A lot of the technical answers I don't have off the top of my head, so it may be helpful if I've got her to, to go through and, and answer some specific questions about you know, I know we've had two two sets of hearings already on this, so Do it we, shouldn't be new, but it's good to have a refresher of, oh, that's right, that's what we were talking about. We were focusing on this and this and this. Um, so that way we can have more easily defensible decisions, um, um, easier to enforce and administer, and they're more consistent with other places around the country because we are basing them on the National Park Service. That's in a nutshell, yeah. so we were doing right. So, so yeah, I think I think the, what would be most helpful for us is, uh, I mean, a presentation at the beginning of it seems fine, and if and if that presentation could be shared ahead of time so we can refresh ourselves, because there's been a lot of changes. I think that not everyone's going to probably have kept track of all the the ideas and changes that took place. Like one example that I just remembered yesterday was the Bailey Bailey Avenue area, right? That neighborhood. Yeah, we, we at one point at a kind of a last minute type of thing, we threw a few parcels in, but then we heard some feedback, and then so we voted to take those parcels back out, right? So, yes, and we rezoned them, or that's part of the proposal. Maybe I'll have to go back. You're right. Having having that off top of our head, I think we were. I think part of the approval process will rezone three properties from. You know, whatever zone they're in now, I think, which is res 6,000, they'll be rezoned as res 9,000 because they're more appropriate in that neighborhood. And then then we follow the neighborhood boundary for the rest of it. Um, yeah. So that's, so that's one of like of several, you know, like little details, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if you could give us, give us some heads up going into it. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll plan to have Meredith at the presentation at the beginning. That, that sounds great. So, yeah. All right, resend docs. All right. Okay, looking forward to it. Everyone uh, get ready for next time, the big hearing. Party! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Derby. Finally. The hearing party. <laughs> we all have is... our own snacks. <laughs> Never as big as when we got done with that zoning. January 2018, the day it finally ended. Yeah, well, we've got a long ways to go for the city plan, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thanks everyone. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, move a second. No, I'll second. <laughs> Okay, second by your Nobody answer. has to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so we are deemed adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. See you later. Bye. Bye.